Welcome everyone to our celebration of Black History Month. Um, it's a time when we recognize and honor the achievements and work of our African American staff. Um, we started these uh, Cultural History Month events back in 2007. Um, and at that, that first uh, celebration, we recognized Archibald Murray, who many of you may not know, uh, but he was actually uh, mm. a, a trailblazer uh, in the legal profession. Uh, and he was the attorney in chief and uh, executive director at the Legal Aid Society from 1975 uh, to 1994. And under his leadership, the society was transformed. Uh, it improved the quality of representation across the board and through his uh, development of, of training programs. You know, I, I, when I started in 1974, we had a training program for the beginning lawyers, and that, that was pretty much it. Uh, but after Arch came in, uh, he instituted training throughout the society for all levels of staff. Um, he actually uh, encouraged the diversification of the staff. And under his direction, we actually had uh, diversity training uh, for managers. It was uh, instituted back probably around 1990. It started in the Criminal Defense Division. Um, it was to be expanded, but uh, after 1994, uh, when Arch uh, was no longer the Attorney in Chief and under the new leadership, it was uh, discontinued for a long period of time. Um, uh, obviously, you know, you all know that we've now reinstituted uh, diversity and inclusion training and anti-bias training, which is an important aspect of our work. Um, perhaps if we had continued it during those those drought years, we'd be at a better stage now than we are. But we have to continue to move forward. Um, tonight, uh, we have a, a, a great presentation, uh, which has put, been put together by Femi Gisu <coughs> Oakley, who's our Director of Diversity and Inclusion. I'm going to tell you who the speakers are, and then I'm going to ask Femi to tell you a little bit about the, the plan for the program. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, three staff members. Uh, we've been having staff members speak for a number of years, and the staff members tonight are, uh, first is Vic Victor Dempsey, his community advocate in the Community Justice Unit. Uh, Victor's brother, Delron Small, was murdered on July 4th 2016 by an off-duty officer, Wayne Isaacs, in Brooklyn, in what was deemed the Brooklyn Road Rage Incident. Most of you have probably seen that event on television because it was broadcast on the news. Uh, after this tragedy, Victor began to seek justice through the legal system. Along the way, Victor and his family aligned themselves with numerous organizations to help bring awareness to his brother's case to shine a light on the social injustices and police brutality faced by communities on a daily basis in hopes of gaining support from communities to strengthen the front line of defense. He and his family sat through the entire trial and regrettably there was a, an acquittal on all counts uh, for that, uh, that brazen event by, by that uh, off-duty police officer. But despite the disappointment and frustration, uh, he continues to help and support communities throughout the city in confronting uh, social injustices. He's really devoted himself to change. Uh, our next panelist is Mavis Smith, who is a paralegal case handler in the civil practice in the Housing Health Program. Hello. Okay. Uh, she's an NYU master's social work student, in addition to her work here. And she's conducting research around the disproportionate amount of culturally and linguistically diverse children referred for special education, beha education and behavioral interventions and the underrepresentation of culturally and linguistically diverse children in gifted and talented classes in the United States. She's also part of a collaborative team that will be hosting a fair chance job fair for individuals with felony convictions on April 11th of this year at NYU. Uh, our next panelist, Loretta Johnson, staff attorney in the Juvenile Rights Project. Loretta is working within the Juvenile Rights Practice on issues of family reunification for our clients. She's an urban justice fellow. Specifically, she's focusing on issues of mass incarceration of mothers and how to keep families of color united. <coughs> the Family Unification Project seeks to empower children and families involved in the child welfare system. The vast majority of these families are low-income minorities, headed by single mothers struggling to navigate living in conditions of poverty. 
Through her project, she provides direct representation to children in child welfare <coughs> proceedings where unification, reunification is the goal. Uh, building a practice model focusing on collaboration with parents' attorneys to speed up the uni reunification process and keep families together. And finally, not a staff member, but we're honored to have uh, as a moderator Nikita Price. I know you don't have that, so. I do have a brief <laughs> video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I didn't know you did. Uh, Zod, are you good? Okay. <laughs> Femi, Femi, Femi got me the information. Oh, okay. I got you. Uh, so, uh, Nikita is a prominent civil rights organizer from Picture the Homeless. Picture the Homeless is a grassroots organization focused on issues such as housing, police violence, and the sheltered industrial complex. He's also a core member of the Legal Aid Society's coalition work with Communities United for Police Reform, leading the fight to ensure police accountability and transparency. We also work with Nikita through our civil law reform efforts on issues of homelessness. So before we have the panel discussion, I want to turn it over to Femi, who's going to tell you a little bit about the discussion. And I just want to commend Femi on the terrific work that she's done as the Director of Diversity and Inclusion since her appointment last May. Probably one of the best appointments that I've made during my entire time. Thank you, Seymour. I'm flattered. Um, thank you guys for being here to celebrate Black History Month. Um, I really appreciate the turnout and everyone coming here tonight. Um, as many of you know, um, for Black History Month this month, I've been sending out daily emails from black leaders. Um, quotes from black leaders, past and present. And I wanted to do this for Black History Month, and I'm hoping to do this for every Heritage Month. Um, but the goal here was to obviously honor and celebrate um, those black leaders in the black community, but also to, not only to honor them, but to inspire and sort of evoke memories, emotions, connections with those people. And what I thought was great when I was sending those quotes out, um, every day I would get responses from you guys, from people in the Legal Aid Society, and they would tell me stories um, about this particular person. Some of the stories would involve them me actually meeting these iconic civil rights leaders, um, talking about how these people impacted them throughout their life, and I just thought it was a great thing for people to share with me. And I hope you were able to share with each other what these powerful leaders meant to you. And that process actually happened with me, um, that sort of connection with these people, these leaders that I was um, quoting daily. Um, specifically, last week, I quoted Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali is one of my heroes. And part of the reason why he's one of my heroes is because he was one of my dad's heroes. And as I was sending out his quote, it really resonated with me because I see the parallels between Muhammad Ali and my father, um, both very proud black men, both very proud Muslim men, um, both strong fighters. My dad wasn't a boxer. Um, he was a real estate agent. But he had, that fight. He, was, he, he had that fighting spirit, you know? Like, he was just outspoken and relentless. Both were very vocal and present in their community. Um, and both were very socially and politically active. And unfortunately, sadly, tragically, um, both succumbed to Parkinson's disease, um, but through that very painful struggle, um, that's when you saw their strength and their resilience the most. And through this process of sort of making these comparisons between these two amazing men, you know, it affirmed what I already thought, which was the people that we look up to are not always the famous um, 
iconic sort of historical figures. There are dads, there are moms, there are brothers, there are sisters, there are family, there are communities. And, and that's the one thing I know about the black community. That's, that's the one thing I know that my family, my father, my mother, the people around me have taught me is that there is so much strength and so much resilience in that community. And that's why I also wanted to quote black leaders within our organization. Because all you have to do is you, you look inside your own home. You don't have to go very far to see what the impact is. And it starts here. It starts with our colleagues, our peers, our clients, the people we help, the people who help us. Those are the people who have the impact. So I really appreciate the leaders, the black leaders in our organization who um, gave me their reflections and I was able to hear their voices about Black History Month. So I really Speaking of leaders, that sort of leads us into this event tonight. And what I want to say about strength and resilience is that it's, it's right here, right? And when I talk about sort of looking inside your own home, looking inside of our own legal aid family, we have people every day who are part of this community who are fighting for this community, who are advocating for this community. Because no matter what systems and structures that were built to tear down the black community, we know that we always persevere. We know that through that painful struggle, we will always fight and we will always advocate. And what I think is so special about these people up here is that they do that in their work, they do that in their community, they do it every day for themselves and for their communities. And today, I, tonight I thought it would be really special to have a panel discussion, and I'm so happy, Nikita, that you're here to lead us in this discussion about the Black Lives Matter movement and how it affects us and how it impacts us. And I will say, I'm so excited and honored that you are all here to share your story with us. Um, because after I talked to all three of you, I remember leaving the conversation and thinking, I have to do more. <laughs> I have to say more, I have to fight more, because you inspired me to do that. And, and that's, that's really what a leader is. So I'm really excited for you guys to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, family. Good evening, family. Good evening. Good evening. All right, that's a little better. So I would like to, first of all, thank um, legal Aid, Mr. Posada, for thinking that I'm, I'm capable of being up here. I, I, I'm truly honored. I would first like to also say that I brought my two daughters and I'm a single father raising two little girls and um, um, child care fell through. As some of uh, our panelists up here can attest to, you take them, well, I'm following them. I'm following those two little people. But I, I, I'm truly grateful to be considered to uh, open up a panel on all of us here, and particularly people of color. Um, 2018 marks the 50th anniversary of um, the murder of Martin Luther King. Um, we, uh, 50 years ago, for some of us in this room that remember 50 years ago, I was a child, um, can remember that things were really kind of rough on us as a race of people. And they still are. They've evolved, they've regressed, but here we are today. And this room looks a lot different than it probably would have 50 years ago. Uh, I'm grateful to be here. Um, family is Family is what brings us all here today. And we're going to discuss family, and in particular, black families, in particular, black lives. So I would like to not um, hold up any 
longer and let's get to it. We have some issues that we would like to discuss this evening with the panel and um, let's start with what the Black Lives Movement means to each and every one of you on the panel. First? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so, so much for listening to me and giving me this opportunity to speak. I've only been at JRP for 18 months, so it means a lot to me to have this honor. Um, and to me, Black Lives Matter, uh, it means so much to me. I've kind of devoted my life to this movement, and I think on the surface, the movement was sparked from police brutality and the killings of um, black women and men by police officers. But I think that that's just the surface of the issue. And really, there is a strong, there's a systemic devaluing and dehumanizing of black people um, throughout the systems in our country, whether it be the criminal justice system, whether it be the family court system, the child welfare system, the education system, the housing um, systems, and to me those killings of those people just, I mean they've been happening for forever, but I think that with technology um, the public has been more aware of it and that sparked this movement, but I'm really grateful for this movement because it gives us an opportunity to really question these systems that we all work within um, and think about how these systems are oppressing uh, black people. When I think of the Black Lives Matter movement, I really think of uh, the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander uh, because I think that's a really good example of she does a really good job of breaking down how the criminal justice system oppresses black people in the same way that um, occurred in slavery and she walks you through how that perpetuated itself through the Jim Crow era and um, throughout our history now in the criminal justice system and I think it's important for us to really analyze how that issue within the criminal justice system also presents itself in all the other systems. So to me, that's what Black Lives Matter means, and I feel that oppression every single day in the work that I do in Manhattan Family Court representing children in child welfare cases. So I've dedicated my life to fighting against that systemic oppression. Ladies first. Oh, okay. That's how we're playing this game. Okay. Everybody wants to be polite. Okay. So, <laughs> to me, Black Lives Matter. Um, it aims to shed light on the importance and contributions of Black people at, as a larger society. Um, it means to help others become cognizant of the injustices that have been in occurring in the Black community for years. Um, it means helping our oppressors to recognize our value as human beings. We're no longer the three-fifths of the person that you thought we were years ago. We're whole people and we do have value. The blatant disrespect and disregard that individuals such as Trump has shown to our black people has now risen to a level that can no longer be ignored. Black Lives Matter is the beginning of an impactful movement to ensure that black people receive the same services advantages and the same access to quality education as their counterparts. Black Lives Matter is more than just a movement. It's a mindset that I believe should be adopted by everyone. Black people have been exploited for hundreds of years. Black people have been subjected to substandard living conditions. More than half of the people in the shelter system in New York City are black. Black bodies are being used for slave labor. Black bodies are being secretly used for biological experiments without financial compensation. Black bodies are being placed into jails to generate profit. Do black lives only matter when it comes to financial gain? Because that's what it seems like. So that's what Black Lives Matter means to me. Uh, 
nervous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for giving me this platform to speak and uh, for all of us to tell our stories. And again, thank you to Anthony, you know, and the uh, CJU unit that's making a lot of difference. It's awesome. What Black Lives Matter means to me, to me it means unity, it means power, you know. For so long, I've sat and watched growing up in my neighborhood and just becoming a young man, just all of the injustices, social injustices in general. And as a child or a young teenager or a young man or adolescent, we didn't understand what it meant. We didn't get what was going on at that specific time, right? So now, you know, pre-technology, pre-cell phone cameras and tape recordings, when I used to see grown men or adults that I, I looked up to from my neighborhood getting harassed on the street corner, getting beat up, and just literally rollerblading off the block and saying, damn, they took such and such to jail, right? So now that I'm an adult, and we see videos on Facebook literally every other day, if not every day, and watching black people and brown people getting murdered blatantly, and people, officers getting away with it. It comes to a point, it, it came to a point when Black Lives Matter rose up, when Black Lives Matter formed that unified front, it gave people like me an outlet. It gave people like me strength. It gave people like me a platform to at least attach myself to, to say it's not gonna happen to me either. I'm not gonna let this happen to my brother or my sister or my friends or the kids I grew up with in this neighborhood. When Black Lives Matter started doing what they was doing and just creating a hashtag, it felt like I was a part of something. It felt like I was a part of something where I can feel good about that my ancestors will feel good about. It felt like I was finally taking a stand for something that we knew was wrong all of these damn years. So for me, Black Lives Matter just meant empowerment to my people, to myself. It meant a way to make sure our voices are heard and not try to be heard anymore. That's what Black Lives Matter. to ask the panel to take themselves back to when the murder of Trayvon Martin was acquitted. Your, your mindset, when a lot of these conversations really actually start coming to light, I mean, across America, across the, um, the world, actually. But what do you think in that particular instance at that point in time brought us to where we are now? Personally, um, in terms of Trayvon Martin, I believe it's because he was an innocent little boy with Skittles going to the store. And I think that was a different narrative than what we've been accustomed to hearing where it was an adult black man. I think it touched people because specifically he was a little boy. It, it, and it, I think it resonated with people because they realized it could happen to their child. So not only did it sit with children, it sat with adults. Look at now, the shooting that just happened in Florida. Children are rising up because other children were killed. So I think that's why it, it was such a great movement. Um, his killing obviously wasn't. But I think what came of it was the magnitude was so big because he was a child and because people were starting to see that it doesn't matter what your, how young you are or how old you are, it's your race that's going to get you in this position. That's, that's why I think. I think uh, uh, for me originally, you know, the first thing that resonated in you, in the community, you know, especially springtime, wintertime, well, fall rather, we wear hoodies, you know? We get dressed, we put on clothes that's comfortable, you know, and around this time, it was like a shocker, like, to the point to where we're saying, okay, this is another young black man killed, murdered. And then on top of that, we have to 
kind of, <laughs> you know, watch what our children are wearing. Watch how we're walking out of the house. So it, it becomes a whole nother spectrum of a way of life that we consider, you know? We, ha we, we can't say, oh, we have to wear a blazer so we don't get killed. You know what I mean? Or we have to make sure that we have on dress shoes, Kohans or something, or Tom Fords, and not Nikes, because they might mistake us for a degenerate. You know, so yeah, we, we um, the, the murder, Taking up that life was just, I can't even describe how it makes me feel personally. But again, the impact that it's had on communities when you're sitting here thinking about your child or your nephew or your little cousin or your young brother that can walk out the house and be mistaken for anything, it's atrocious, you know? So not only did it set a fire to the nation, but it really made especially people of color have to do a double check when you get to your front door before you walk out the house that's a you know sometimes we, we look at the bright the picture that they give us in front of or the picture that the media portrays but it does so much more to the communities it does so much more the feeling that i have to pay attention to what i'm wearing or purchasing is indescribable I've witnessed a lot of people don't know what that feels like, you know? And you don't know what it feels like to take off a black hoodie and just put on a t-shirt, even if it's cold outside, because you're scared you might get mistaken for something else. So Trayvon Martin's murder, as indescribable as it really is, it touched me in a completely different way. It started a whole chain and network of other conversations where we try to protect our own because nobody else is protecting us. I would just echo everything that's been said. And um, when Trayvon Martin was killed, I was working in Harlem at the Harlem Children's Zone as a student advocate. And so I had a bunch of children that I was watching over in the summer um, and I spent a lot of time with them and I had the opportunity to sit down and talk with all of them about what Trayvon's killing meant to them and I had them write about it and I've saved everything they wrote because it was so touching to me. I still have it to this day. Um, and all of them said something to the effect of what, what Trayvon's killing means to me is that I can't just go get Skittles. I can't just wear a hoodie. I have to be scared about being killed and the person who kills me has no consequences for that. And I just, I mean, I just saw that they were all terrified and there was nothing that I could say to them to help them feel comforted or feel safe. And I, I have my own personal feelings about how awful that was happening to a child, but to see the effect that it has on children and then to talk to their parents about the conversations their parents have to have with them about simple things like going to get skittles or wearing a hoodie it was just crazy and ridiculous and really hard to go through and it, it I, I was really grateful for the opportunity to hear from the kids but I just felt this sense of hopelessness and sorrow that the way that we're living is just so wrong, it's so unfair, and a lot of people think that everything is okay now that it's 2018, and the problems that our ancestors and our families dealt with are over, but that moment just solidified for me that everything is still so real and present, and it's just so sad, and hard to watch and I am grateful that Trayvon's killing helped to spark this movement but I I don't want to see any any more of these killings and I'm just really hopeful that these children can f learn to feel safe somehow despite that we've completely failed in making them feel safe Thank you.
I'd like to highlight uh, something here locally. Um, walking with a purpose. Romali Graham was killed in his home in front of his grandmother and his little brother. And Romali Graham was a young man also because he was seen by the police and followed home and the doors were kicked in and he was killed in front of his baby brother and his grandmother. <coughs> and it was stated at the trial that he was walking with a purpose. You mentioned putting on hoodies. Uh, we'll get into implicit bias later. But what makes Romali Graham's situation any different than uh, Trayvon's? And why are we not as outraged over that? And, and I, I know there are people that are, but I don't think we are on a national or a, 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 a movement spectrum as, as moved by that young person's death. Any death is, is wrong, but why? And, and, and they were close, I mean, in time. We're five years later now. Um, one, one individual was acquitted and in the Romali Graham case now, we see that an officer had to resign and a couple officers, uh, the sergeant is going to be fired and then one's being placed on probation. So we are in a different place. Why are they different, the two cases? I personally met Romali Graham's family a few years ago at a poetry event. Um, so for me, I don't think this question is something I can answer mm -hmm. because they all sit the very same with me emotionally. Um, I know, I don't know what they're going through. Obviously, I can't empathize, but I can sympathize with them. So I don't think that's a question that I can answer because to me, Trayvon and, and Romali and Khalil Browder and all the young black men that are, you know, were shot down are similar in my, in my mind. So. She's 100 percent right in my opinion too. I mean, there's really you can't compare the way a life was taken to another. I mean, I will shed some light on it to my personal opinion, mm -hmm. and this is something that I've been trying to battle with Family United for Justice, you know as well. But a lot of times, and we we've seen it happen. Some cases may get publicity more than others. Some cases may be reported on immediately after it happens, some later on, or it may be some type of a cover-up or something that's going on, right? My sentiments don't change. My sentiments do not, when I, let me tell everybody something. Just like Nikita knows, I'm part of another organization called Families United for Justice. This is not an organization where we take membership cards on a regular basis. This is not something you can sign up to or take a number and hope it comes around and we pick you. Family United for Justice is an organization that is comprised of families that were affected directly of police brutality. This means Cephas Johnson, who was Nicholas Hayward Jr.'s uncle. This is Mike Brown Sr., who was Mike Brown Jr.'s father. A constant <laughs> Uh, Malcolm, who is Romali Grants, you know what I mean? This, these family members, this is not a club I wanted to be a part of. Mm. It's not, by no, no way and how, how I picture myself wearing and saying I'm associated with Family United for Justice. And I say that because that question that you just asked, why is it so different? We, and I use a personal example, fighting my brother's case. A few months prior, to I will get an our verdict, the Philando Castillo's verdict came out. I remember being in Detroit at an ACDC me Allied Media Conference with all the families, and I watched grown men, women just break down in tears because the officer got off. 
And I remember my sister sitting with me in the hotel room and we're just staring at each other. Nobody wants to talk about it. But we're like, this guy got murdered live on Facebook. And not just his community in front of billions of people. And that cop got away. And all we could think of, what's gonna happen to my brother's case? We got him on video. We got, you know, we got him shooting my brother three times. Left him there to die. What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? And it's very hard to be optimistic when it's so close to home. It's hard. And part of this fight, and this is another thing that another reason why Black Lives Matter is so near dead to my heart, is because it's not time to wait for anything to happen anymore. The, now's the time to mobilize and say we're not going to let it happen again. Some of these cases are reactive, where we need to stand up from the very beginning as a unified front. And maybe it might change how it's recorded. Maybe it might change how it's viewed. Maybe. But I can't spectate that, you know? But yeah, to, I mean, to answer that, there's, there's no difference in the case. Mm -hmm. The difference is how people take to it. Mm -hmm. The difference is how, what's the importance of it to you? The difference is, do you have a young man in your household that you fear for now? Mm -hmm. Or do you just see the news and say, damn, that's messed up and go about your day? That's the difference. Mm -hmm. And just to echo off that, I, I agree with everything said, that there is absolutely no difference. But I think the problem is, is that people are so used to seeing this mm. now that it's become the norm. And people just look at it and say, oh, another kid was killed by a cop. And nobody is really even affected in the way that we may have been early on. And that's incredibly problematic and that's why this movement is so important because it's an it's an opportunity for us to energize and stop this before it happens again because each killing is just as wrong um, so yeah I don't want to repeat anything else said I agree with everything let you um, shift it a little bit if we could talk about um, the criminal justice reform and child welfare reform mm -hmm. as it equates to all of us in this room, legal aid folks, if you're representing families, children, um, when it comes to how we are viewed as a race in family courts, as a race in criminal courts. Can you give me some thoughts on this? <laughs> okay, you said family court and criminal court, but I, I just want to also add a piece to that, which is education in general. Um, so as I said earlier, my work is around how white teachers predominantly perceive black students mm -hmm. and how that affects how they teach these students. If you walk into a classroom as a white teacher and don't believe the child can learn or that they're, you know, once they turn 18, they're going to go to jail, you're not going to invest your time in teaching that child. I've read evaluations from teachers that were confidential who call out children nigglets. If you teach your nigglets to apply themselves, maybe they won't end up in jail. And these are the things that I'm reading from teachers, superintendents, principals who are teaching our children. So it's the perception of black children that they have that make them not want to apply any type of help to these children. Um, and on top of that, there's a school to prison pipeline system, right? The achievement gap between white and black children is widening with every year if you look at the statistics. So not only are teachers pretty much dumbing our students down because of their internal biases, they're actually separating the achievement between them and white children. And in terms of the child welfare system, I have three foster kids at home right now. They're not my foster kids, they're my mom's kids. However, 50% of the kids in the foster care system are black or Spanish. And statistics show that they're either gonna end up in jail or they're gonna be, I'm sorry, they're gonna end up in jail or they're gonna be homeless by the time they exit the foster care system. So it's, to me, it comes down to the perception that 
people, and I'm not saying white people, I'm saying people who have biases of, about black people in general, that affects the outcome of black children. I mean, when I think about children in general, you know, that's, I remember talking with Anthony about this. And for a while, everyone asks, how can I move on when my brother's case is so fresh? And I'm, I'm not moving on. It's never going to go anywhere. It's my brother, you know. It's, we, had, we were inseparable. But what I had to start to think about and worry about, rather, was my two-year-old son and my two-year-old nephew that my watch my brother get killed. So I had to shift gears now. I had to say, what am I going to do with my breath on this earth to make it different for my nephews, to make it different for my son, to make it different for the kids in my community. I had to figure something out. There was, there was something I had to focus on, right? But we talk about child welfare, man. It's, it's People say, oh, you don't know where these kids come from, or just like, like you said, you know, they, they, they're dumbing it down, or they're making it seem like something's wrong. But when you look at a grown person now, right, I can look at everyone in this room. I don't know how many of us in this room was raised on love. I don't know how many of us in this room was raised on survival. There's a keen difference between that. You know, we can come from loving families and homes and, and, and have everything put together. It doesn't mean you wasn't trying to survive either. But there's all people out there that's raised on survival. We don't know what it is to have things. We don't know what it is to do anything. We just want to make it to the next day. You know, and the, the welfare system, I'm a product of it. <laughs> you know, I don't shy away from it. I don't shame. I embrace it. I remember when I was a kid, I was abused in foster care, and I had a legal aid representation. Me and my sister came in, filed charges. They took the lady away. We changed our names, you know, and it took years to speak the truth. It took years to not look the other way when someone's looking me in the eye or not feel ashamed of what I've been through or say, oh, I'm not going to be anything because everyone's constantly saying you're not going to be sh But this is what's going on. It's easy for me to say and tell you that and, you know, head, see the head nods nodding, oh, that's messed up. But what about the kids who don't have the voice? What about the people that's implementing the systems, that's putting these kids in those systems, but don't really know what's going on? Right? So it's, it's, the reform aspect is great that someone's talking about reform, but what the hell are we really doing to change it? So this, I, again, me, but I try to look at everything because it's the voices that we're not hearing, the victims' voices that we are not hearing, that we need to be paying attention to. It's not always just the, uh, people that's working on it or the people that's implementing the programs or the systems, they're not the ones that's going through it. We get the people that's going through it and hear their voices, then we can understand what's really happening. Well, I'm trying to do something about it in my work. Um, not sure, let's talk about you. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just trying to pick it back off you. Um, so, I have a fellowship. Um, I'm sponsored by Kramer Levin. It's the Equal Justice Works Fellowship where I was able to develop a project to address some of the systemic devaluing and dehumanizing of um, black children and black families, black and brown, I should say, um, because the vast majority of the children and families that come through family court are low income and minority children. A lot of them are families that are headed by single mothers that are just really struggling to navigate through conditions of poverty. And like you said, they are, a lot of people are working from a space of survival and not necessarily the idyllic situation of love and being able to provide everything you would want to be able to provide for your family. Unfortunately, these families are scrutinized and children are ripped from their homes um, and the government is just way, way too involved in these families' lives. So my project focuses on building a practice model that supports reunification within JRP more, that um, I'm developing a model motion to 
speed up the reunification process and avoid unnecessary removals of children from their homes and really to bring those children that are going through it every day, bring their voices to the forefront of these cases and protect their rights to be raised by their parents and to live with their families and their right to be free from foster care and government intervention in, into their lives. And I believe that through empowering these children, we can empower their parents and their families and empower the community um, and keep families together more and um, I think I wanted to like I wanted to talk a little bit about how Black Lives Matter applies so much to the child welfare system um, I think when you remove a child from their home it's an attack on that well if you remove the child from their home and there is not real imminent risk of harm that they're suffering from that is an attack on a black child's body. Um, and like was mentioned, the foster care system is the most segregated, one of the most segregated systems. Mm -hmm. So these are really black children that are being ripped from their homes. Uh, there's a, a term called the new Jane Crow. I mentioned the new Jim Crow. There's a term, the new Jane Crow, which talks, that addresses the story of the mother that's experiencing this extreme level of governmental governmental intervention of her life and her family where she's being drug tested without her consent when she gives birth and it's almost like a criminalization of pregnancy and another form of social control um, I also wanted to mention the Adoption for Safe Families Act which is a federal statute that attempts to speed up ad the adoption process and terminate parents' rights, um, which it, which in undermines black families' lives and just basically kills the black family by terminating a parent's rights, um, all in the name of having permanency for children. And permanency for children usually means aging out of foster care or getting adopted and we know that adoptions a lot of the times fail and those children go home um, to their parents. Also I think that the implicit bias within the system comes out a lot when you have the court ordered supervision over families when children aren't removed from their families the government legally requires that the family comply with certain services or rules as if black families are incapable of governing themselves um, and they need that government in intervention and there's this skepticism that that black families need that oversight to ensure that they're in line with whatever middle class standards that judge may have or the other practitioners in the court may have and I think there's a huge lack of understanding of the circumstances that these families are coming from and we need to have more understanding of that and we need to support these families more um, and the problem is that this continues to perpetuate itself because it's all under the guise of kindness and protecting these children but I think we really need to question if we're really protecting these children by ripping them from their homes and everything that they know and who they are and telling them that who they are is not right and is wrong and they need services. Um, I'm not saying that there aren't children that need help, but I think we really need to question every single case that we see and how we can, we need to question how we can help these families so I hope that my project will help to address some of these issues and help to empower the, the black and brown families that we see so frequently and eventually empower the community because it's really interesting when you compare what we're doing these, to these families to what happened to the families in slavery. It's essentially the same thing. Um, we're breaking them apart and that affects these children and 
quite frequently the children don't want to be taken from their family. And it's intergenerational trauma as a result of all of that. Yeah. It keeps happening. It's what you're saying. It's a revolving door, you know. Mm -hmm. Just and everything she said goes back to the first point I made, you know. Are we being raised in love or raised in survival? <coughs> you know, you have a parent or a young adult that's having a child coming from foster care or coming from all these different unfortunate steps through life, right? You can take somebody's lineage, so to speak, or, or just their history, right? You start off as a young kid in foster care, you're angry, you're not with your family, you're mad, you're not acting out because you're crazy, you're acting out because don't want to understand your pain, right? Yeah, I had, like, the kid I had, he was, I've had foster kids come in and out for the past four years. He told me that in the Ch Manhattan Children's Center, where they keep the children, he's eight. He was in a room of ten other boys. That's pretty much having a child in prison already. You're, you're living in a room with ten other children because you're in foster care. It's unfair to them. And, you know, I know you can speak to this, Danielle, because this is the work that you do. <laughs> but you're not on the panel, though. <laughs> but I say, no, not that. I wasn't a shot at you. But, um, but I'm saying this to say that, you know, it's intergenerational trauma. These children have adverse life experiences, which now affects their mental health going forward. And we have to think about the impact of foster care in general and how these adults are now going to grow up and treat their children as a result that yep. and it goes further you know we can continue to go on with that lineage it goes further than that again someone getting out of foster care or let's say they age out of foster care because a lot of times in age there's an age most people who's adopted they don't want to adopt teenagers they're already setting their mindset unfortunately right mm -hmm. where do they go then group homes mm -hmm. now you're in group homes they're probably not getting the clothes they want or they can't fit in you know, you get a stipend, what, every Friday or something like that, right? Now they're living that lifestyle, then what do you age out of there? 21. What do you do then? You rely on the system, you rely on government assistance, you rely, what do you do? But this whole process, we just talked of 18 year, 21 year span, where does the help come in at? Where does the reform come in at? Where does that interjection come in at to where we say, hey, Let's show you a different way to do this, right? How do we implement that and continue to implement that? Not just take on one case or take on a neighborhood kid you see every, you know what I mean? How do we end that cycle? And like I said, it goes further than that. 21, you have a kid, you get pregnant. Now they're taking your DNA unwillingly. How do you, what do you know about raising a child? You didn't have anything of your own. And then what happens? She's on welfare. She has to yep. sign the baby father up because he's not around to take care of him. And now this young man is getting chased for child support, potentially getting locked. You get a, it's a cycle, and it's not catered to us. In that system that these children are being taken from their families from and put into is expensive. Yeah. It's not cheap at all. And what would happen if we took that money and we put it towards the families and helping the families navigate whatever they're going through rather than ripping the families apart. It could probably be cheaper, honestly. Not that that's what matters, but that's what I, one of you said is what it seems like is all that matters. I, I see, I saw a hand up and so I do want to get some questions from folks here in the room if we could and then we'll get back on track. So I'm going to start with the brother in the corner hiding behind the... Uh... <laughs> I, think you guys, I, 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 I think this is a really, really great discussion. And I thank all of you for involving yourself. And I thank all of you for the passion in which you, um, you, you spoke. But I just wanted to add, because the question was also asked about the justice system. And I think in terms, as, as a father of of teens, 16 year old, 17 year old, etc. I too have a lot of that fear when they walk out or when my kids are in, are, are in school. So I'm very active in my, my, my kids' school. Um, I've actually made changes in one of their schools where the way they deal with special education ch um, children, the way they, 
they investigate um, um, incidents in in the school. Again. Five five things the school have had to um, do. The school had also had to retrain the teachers when it came to black black youth. Mm -hmm. But I want to touch on the justice system. I think a lot of times we see so many of these 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 deaths, so many of these police shootings, etc. It is because the judges are implicit um, in it. it. It is because the judges allow it, right? As long as if a cop comes to court and says says that I saw a bulge, or if the cop comes comes co comes to court and say I fear for my life, um, et, et cetera, it seems that because there are cases on the books where cops have walked away um, with those types of defenses, it continues on and on and on. So, and as long as two DAs can go into precincts and tell the cops basically what you need to say in order to get out of this, and they and they say it, they get out of it, then the others use it. I think what absolutely needs to be, what needs to also be, be done is that judges have to start paying a price for allowing some of these people to these cops to walk away from situations where they know consciously they they know that you know what this cop was wrong but he may have he may have feared um, um etc and that's and that's not always the truth right because if a cop believes if I can get away with killing your 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 child or your kid and I simply say I saw a bulge I feared for my life ex, um etc and you want to notch on your belt, that's what happened. I also have cops in my family. So we've had discussions um, be um, before. And um, you know, just, just to say, you know, it, 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 it is to the judges and the system that's in, in place that allows a lot of these killer cops to get away. And so, you know, the movement, the Black Lives Movement and other movements, that's wonderful. Um, but there should also be a, a movement against the DAs and the movement against the judges, um, um, et cetera, because it is they that set the precedence. Thanks. Anyone else? Ma'am, and then you want to check. So I work in therapy as a social worker, and um, I primarily with the delivery team, but I do have some CP cases, child record cases. And so what I find across the board with all the cases that I have is there seems to be um, different, like similar cases, but different outcomes, right? Um, and so my own struggle in particular is with ACS. That's kind of my own personal fight, right? Um, and so I'm wondering from each one of you, from your respective um, offices, what do you think that we as legal leaders need to do to keep systems accountable? That you think, like any organization within the system, whether it's police, ACS or literally anything that you you think that would be good for us to just keep those organizations accountable? I think that my project allows me to keep ACS accountable. Um, I, they don't like when I'm on their cases because I'm <laughs> usually fighting. Doing your job. I'm usually <laughs> fighting against them, and they don't like me. But um, I don't care. I team up with the parent attorney and we go at ACS. A lot of the time the judge is more likely to side with ACS because it's safer for them, um, which is frustrating. But I think it, from JRP's perspective, how we can keep the government accountable is by not siding with ACS as much. Like I think we need to question what our job is in JRP. Is our job to keep these children safe or is our job to protect these children's legal rights to not be in foster care or to live with their family? Our job isn't to keep the children safe. That's ACS's job. And I think a lot of the time we might think that's our job, but it's not. 
our job is to follow the direction of our client if they're of the right age and if they're not our job is to protect their legal rights to not have the government interfere with them their lives also to not have their parents abusing them but most of the cases that we see are not those cases they're parents that are just struggling and need help and most of the time the kids should stay with their parents and so I think that we need to question when we are siding with ACS and I think we need to give ACS a harder time we need to make their job harder we need to make sure they're really showing that they search for that that non-respondent father when they're about to remove a kid instead of putting that kid in foster care we need to make sure they really made reasonable efforts before they removed the kid from their home so I think we can absolutely hold ACS more accountable. I think JRP is in a really, really good position to do that. Uh, this question first before I answer that. Do all of us here know about the Community Justice Unit? We know the Community Justice Unit? Everyone in this room. Y'all know what we do, the work that we do? Okay, no. so. No. Okay. No. Never heard of this. What? <laughs> I'm sorry, it's gonna take me. <laughs> right. No, no, but seriously. Anthony Posada, please raise your hand. Jermaine Thompson, Nefertiti Ankara, that's any uh Michelle Fields, Quasi Dash. These are my counterparts in our unit, which I'm humbly a part of. And we're missing a few other attorneys um that aren't here. But me and Jermaine are the newly acquired community organizers here, right? Along with the attorneys and the work that they've been doing before us, the fights that I've watched Anthony put up, the the spunkiness I've seen Nefertiti and Kwesi do when they're talking to clients or going to court for them, right? Sometimes that passion alone is what I really see sets the difference between us and our clients, right? Or even dealing with a specific case or individual case, right? So back to a community justice unit. We work directly with the CMS, uh, Cure Violence um, model throughout the city. Got a numerous amount of sites throughout all the boroughs, right? So Cure Violence was a model that was taken up in Chicago, was brought to New York. Um, they're actually pretty damn good at it. It's a uh, pre prevention of gun violence in certain neighborhoods, right? So each site has a catchment area. They control that neighborhood, and they try their very best to keep the gun violence down, or any violence for that matter. Legal Aid, we come in as part of the wraparound service. Provide legal services to them, but they also get job readiness things. They get dealt with housing, or they have mentorships through the sites with their outreach workers and their violence interrupters. So I say all that because I think it's very important for Legal Aid Society as a whole to understand what this unit brings to the table. When I say we're out there, rain, sleet, or snow, canvassing the neighborhood, speaking with the communities directly, mouth to mouth. Not so much as, uh, oh, this person may need help, but that happens too, referrals. But we try to go out there and we try to show them they're with, there's people that care. You know, we give them an outlet to their voices to be heard. So when you talk about holding systems accountable, right, what systems hold accountable, we have to hold all of them accountable. I mean, yeah, we're all in our respective units, we get that, but how often do we interact with each other in these units, right? Mm -hmm. How often the case gets brought up in court, it might be a conflict, oh, we can't take it, it goes to 18B, or it's a child of but we pass it off to JRP or civil. How often does that happen to any one of us, right? But how often do we follow up even after we pass it along? Yeah, some of us might say we're overworked, some of us might say we have way too much going on, or we can't remember, I get it. But the passion and the fire that burns, the passion that you have when you took the job, is what our clients look for every single day. Every single day. I've been working for Legal Aid Society, how long, Anthony? Two months. A whole two months. <laughs> you know, and I'm starting to realize, and I, I said this to them, I said this to Michelle Anthony during the interview process, I said, I don't even know why I'm here, I don't know why I'm sitting in an interview with you guys, I don't belong here. But he kept saying, Victor, it's your, it's your story, it's the story, it's what you've done, where you've come from, where you are now. You don't understand how much power that holds. I'm like, yeah, all right, cool, dude. Still didn't get it. I, I'm serious, truly, I still did not get it. 
But I was already fighting so much other stuff that fell directly in line with all the injustices that we fight every day. And so Anthony kept pushing me to any client I came across, or anybody that had a messed up situation, to tell my story. And to see the sigh of relief on their faces some days is enough for me to keep going. So back to holding systems accountable. If I don't hold myself accountable for making some form of a change every single day I walk out of my house, I can't hold anybody else accountable if I'm not holding myself accountable. So yeah, we talk about all the systems. We talk about who's to blame. We talk about who should do what. It starts here. It starts literally right here. So I actually do that first before we look at the systems. Um, for me, I believe that in, in holding ACS accountable, I do believe that there needs to be a lot of professional development training that happens with ACS. Um, of course, their workers, you know, they're overworked, they're underpaid, they have a high caseload. Um, I have ACS come to my house to check up on the foster kids because that's their job. Um, but there are kids that fall through the cracks, like Nick's Mary Brown that we all know about. Um, so for me personally, I believe accountability starts with giving them professional development training, making sure they have enough staff to follow up with the cases that they get. And on top of that, just making sure that they're not getting those cases where you know the neighbor is just making a report on the next neighbor because they don't like each other, you know? Because that happens a lot when it comes to ACS. There are, there are false reports that are made. Um, and it's just a matter of ACS going through and, and figuring out which one of those are just retaliation reports and making sure they have enough staff um, to make sure these kids are safe. That's what it comes down to, to me, for ACS. Okay. Mia? Hi, my name is Amantala and I'm a forensic social worker here in Brooklyn. And my question to the panel is, what is your response to those people who say all lives matter or blue lives matter? Your response to that? It was coming, but <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> it was coming. It's there. Uh, do you want to get into that now or just wait until later? Um, Might as well. Can, can we kind of stay on this? Because I she think we're. Uh, no, 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 no. I know <laughs> if it's going to be all right because it is right here. Actually, I do have it right here. Uh, all lives matter, blue lives matter. But I do want to, I, I do want to kind of stay in this area of accountability because I believe it's important. I think accountability has to be spread out. The brother mentioned accountability in, in the courts, accountability with uh, service providers. How do we get the youth? to buy into accountability? Mm -hmm. How do we get them to want to uh, see, because I, I know there's a percentage of young people that see that this is not the way that it should, it's supposed to be. How do we hold them and make them be a part of making this change and holding people accountable? Because a lot of them are, are it's hard enough to get young people to open up, but I think once we do get them to open up, and we're hearing that now, especially after Trayvon, we're hearing young people. When are we gonna start listening to them and putting them at the forefront of holding uh, uh, the system accountable, especially um, young black and brown uh, um, youth, especially youth that are caught up in, in, in the system? I, I, I know this, um, at last count, and I could be wrong, the city, New York City spends $1.8 billion on the shelter system. How much do they spend in the foster care system? And you were talking about diverting monies and, and, and putting funds to where it could be uh, <clears throat> better used. So does anybody in here have an idea of how much the city spends on foster care? Because I don't. I'm sorry, I don't. But $1.8 billion, because we're talking, and then you were talking about that, that revolving door. Mm -hmm. uh, take a, you know, uh, in injecting yourself into a family situation, removing that child, putting that child into foster care, that child aging out of foster care, and unfortunately, the chances of that child going into um, the shelter system or into prison mm -hmm. is probably the most likely step. Mm -hmm. Now, you, uh, now, in the shelter system, that's $1.8 billion. Mm -hmm. Whether you're a single adult, whether you're a young mother, 
with a child or whether you're a family, a, a single mother with three to four children. Um, my children were in um, um, the shelter system and I had to get custody of them. So I, I kind of have a, a little idea of that. How do, we, how do we get that money and how do we engage our youth to want to change this? Because I, I, I think this does reflect on Black Lives Matter also. Because young people are really tired of the way a lot of this has been going on. And they're just, they're angry at a lot of people, including some of us in this room. You know, and rightfully so. So how do we get them to, 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 to think that we want to change it and, and, and get some of their input. Um, okay, so for me personally. I got you though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was in high school, I literally had Dr. Lenora Filani and Ms. Pamela Lewis from the All Stars Project come into our school. I went to Clara Barton High School. We had to go through metal detectors every day. Felt like a prisoner just trying to go to high school, right, every morning. Um, and she literally came in to tell us about a program called Development School for Youth. Her entire presentation, well, their entire presentation, rather, was you are poor. <laughs> you are poor. And as a group of children sitting in an auditorium, we're like, what are you talking about, ladies? Like, we're just in school. Like, we're good. No, you're poor. You're black children. You're poor. And then they showed us statistics. They showed us, you know, projection of what we were supposed to be as we got older. And that made me, especially, want to rise up and go to Albany and speak to legislators upstate um, about issues that affect black and brown children. Because I didn't realize how disadvantaged I was until she physically came to us and told us that we were poor and compared us to other groups of people. So I think it's a matter of educating children and making them realize that they're not as advantaged as they probably think they are. And that would foster their um, ability to, to be passionate. No disadvantage if they do want to change also. Yes. Or disadvantage if they do want to change. Or disadvantage here because you're poor. Exactly. I mean, because you're an example. Uh, I don't want to be poor. I don't want to be poor. I think we're all here for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, another aspect that I've been trying to tackle, even along with the community justice unit, please keep that in mind. Community justice unit. I'm very proud to be a part You're of the really community justice unit. <laughs> but, uh,. One of the things, like I said earlier when I was speaking about my nephew and, and my son, you know, trying to create a platform to where they're not fighting as much. I don't think the fight will ever stop, unfortunately, but as much is my concern right now, right? So one of the ways I, for, for me, and you know, I try to, how about some of the guys that I know in certain neighborhoods to kind of show the same thing. A lot of times kids, I remember growing up, you know, I used to look up to my big brother. I used to look up to my older cousins that they used to ride motorcycles and dirt bikes and they had the life in my opinion, you know? And I wanted to be like them. I wanted to just be like, seriously, I just wanted to be like them. I didn't know what kind of job they had for a while. I didn't know. I just, they dope. They ride bikes. So I want to be like them, right? So now this day and age, the kids are completely different. The kids are completely different. When I was 13 or 14, I don't really, really want to say what I was doing, but I wasn't thinking you about... You working now, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you know, do want to keep your job. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, when I was 13 or 14, I was thinking about girls. That was it, you know? But these kids now, they're going, they're marching on Washington, D.C., and yeah. they're going to Albany, yeah. and they're writing yeah. letters to the presidents. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's a momentum that we as adults yeah. need to embrace. Yeah. yeah. We can't let children or we can't let you feel like they're doing it alone. Because believe it or not, that's exactly what's happening. They're taking control right. of this movement. They're taking their lives into their own hands. And they can't even vote. Exactly. <laughs> and it's very unfortunate, right? Because whether we as adults want to admit it or not, have we really been role models to them or have we been so consumed in our own self-gratification? 
or our own self worth or self gain, right? So even when we when I when I go places, for instance, I went to Detroit. This this is what changed everything for me. We had this Allied Media Conference. It was a <laughs> school, uh, the college out in Detroit. Families United went. We were invited there. And this school caters to young journalists, media people, analysts, potential news anchors. That's the kind of school they were, right? So we were presenting to them because our idea was if we take time out to now, the student that's going to school for this, to reshape how the news is presented, mm -hmm. right? To catch them early on, to get them to understand how important what's happening now is, see how it's resonating with them, how it's affecting them. I'm talking about telling these stories, we're getting tears, they're coming up to us, snotty noses, messing up my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it did something to me. It made me understand like, wow, this, this is really touching them. Yeah. Like they're hurt. So to really, for us, in my opinion, it was getting to that level of youth, right? And telling them, Everything that we're going through now, you guys can make it better. You know, I'm not saying it's over for us, but we're kind of passing the torch along, right? We're kind of grooming our next generation to make something happen. And it's been like that. History proves itself. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, we're still doing the same thing. Black Lives Matter comes from that, right? It arises from that type of movement. So when we talk about youth, that's my biggest concern. Mm -hmm. I'll be there, just like the brother said. If my son's only to be three. When he starts driving a car, you think I'm not going to be nervous? And this, if it was like this 20 years from now, he's a dad, I just got pulled over. I'll probably have a heart attack, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest thing to approach with these youth is empowering them and letting them know we have your back, right? Because it's kind of hard to say, I'm going to show you the way. Because they're like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's the sad reality. We laugh at it. But believe it or not, I see it every single day now. Yeah. We go to these neighborhoods and, and we canvas and stuff. And anyone says, what's all these kids out here? Who's in charge out there? <laughs> what's the dope? There ain't no dopes no more. Seriously. And when we talk about this, everyone acts like it doesn't. But it's the God on its truth. These kids are raising their selves. They're coming up with their own opinions, right? They do, and, and you're right, there are kids out there that say this is wrong and it shouldn't be like this. And they're standing up and they're fighting, but where the hell are we? Sitting here watching? We have to give them some type of support. We're all capable and able and in certain positions to where we can support them and continue to push them forward. Not even push, we need to start propelling them. You know, so that's just my thing. But right mm -hmm. now, with community justice unit, man, just going to these care violence sites and we deal with at high risk kids, mm -hmm. high risk individuals, right? But to me, it's not high risk. This that was me. I'm looking at these kids. I did the same stuff, the same stuff. I got all of your guys' attention now. I guarantee I wouldn't have had it 15 years ago. No way, no. And I'm I'm serious about that because that's how much I. When you believe in someone, when you believe in somebody, and you give them the tools to succeed, and you give them the tools to change opinions and change their mindset, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. I would have never thought I would have been sitting in this office. I was that kid, foster care, group homes. I went to jail. I came home, and I'm dead serious. <laughs> I'm sorry. I get a little carried away, but I'm so serious, man. And... I say this again, and I thank Anthony again. I thank the people who helped this position. Just the thought of me being in this position and understanding that somewhere along the way, legal aid thought about expanding. Legal aid said we have to do something that can help us reach out more, right? And that's bringing in someone of my capacity <laughs> and say, let's try to figure it out together. But when you talk about youth, we have to figure it out together. Because these kids are lost. She's good job. Thank you. Sorry, I, take up some more time. I think we really need to focus back on the education system and the opportunities that these children have, which are slim to none. And when you talk about how do we hold them accountable, we are not being accountable to them by not giving them opportunities. I made it a point in my head today to not focus 
so much on all the problems, but to highlight mm -hmm. at some point mm -hmm. how amazing these black and brown youth are, how resilient they are, how strong they are, how talented they are, how much they have to offer, but they don't have the direction or, or the opportunity. And I think that's our failure. We need to improve these schools. We need to inspire these children, whether it be individually ourselves or through the education system. They're smart. They're figuring things mm -hmm. out on their own. They got their social media. They're making these movements. We need to help them channel that energy and that brilliance in a productive way that can help us all as a people, and we're not doing that. And we can't ask them to be accountable. To We can't ask them to learn about accountability when we're not being accountable to them at all. Thank you, and that was very important. And I want to, but I would love if you guys could touch upon um, that question about all lives matter. Yep. I think it's going to be our yep. last question, yep. um, but I, I, I think it's, mm -hmm. it's so important, um, even though we are running out of time, yep. I really want to give you guys that that sort of platform to talk about that, and then, and, you know, unfortunately that would be the end of our program, mm -hmm. but, you know, if you guys have more questions and you guys can stick around, I would love for you guys to to do that. I can go first. So when someone asks me that, the first thing I do is take a deep breath <laughs> and assess what state I'm in. Am I <laughs> state of mind? Do I really want to go there right now? <laughs> um, because I think when you ask that question, you're missing the point and you're just displaying your, if, I'm sorry if you have that question personally, but you're displaying your ignorance because for you to wonder why we're not saying all lives matter means that you don't recognize that there is this systemic devaluing, dehumanizing of black and brown people. There's not that for police officers or white people or whatever group wants to be included in the Black Lives Matter. That's not present for them, so there's no need for you to say that their lives matter. Everyone knows that, because that's how we operate in society. We value their lives, whereas black lives are not valued, which is why we have to say black lives matter, because that's not how our country treats black lives. So I think if you're wondering why we're not being more inclusive with this movement, we actually are very inclusive <laughs> with this movement but you're completely missing the whole entire point of it. I don't got nothing to say after that. <laughs> I mean, I, I echo similar sentiments, right? All lives do matter, right? But if you look at the history of things, we can see that black lives don't matter as much, right? If we want to put it that way to some people. Um, so. Like she said, if someone says all lives matter to me, I'm gonna question why is that even your, your reply to me? Because it just, to me it brings me back to a place of argumentation that I don't wanna have. Black lives matter because when I look at the TV, nine times out of 10 it's a black person that's getting shot. It's not a white person that's getting shot. It's not a, it's not, it's a white officer that's getting off when there's clearly evidence that the person was un, um, I'm sorry, clearly evidence that the person did not have a gun or have a weapon of any sort. So all lives do matter. However, when someone asks me that question, I have to show them and acknowledge and just teach them that black lives do matter because we're the ones that's being shown on TV every day, shot up on the floor, in the, in the car, like Philando Castile. So, that's my response to that question. It's a tough question no matter who you ask, but that's just my opinion on it. Just, just I'll add on a little bit because, you know, just so I want to address the whole Blue Lives Matter thing now, right? When I think about that, I mean, I know a few people who do know me. My girlfriend's a cop. I just date a cop, right? Mm -hmm. You know how hard it was for me to wake up every day or go to sleep every day knowing the officer killed and murdered my brother? 
or going to a rally and not having, well, I'm not going to say I didn't have my girlfriend's support, but even putting her in that discomfort, uh, uncomfortable place, you know, it's hard. But I've had numerous people. So I have friends that's officers. I got family, other family members that's officers, DOC, NYPD, you know. And when the whole thing came about, I'm like, same sentiment. What the hell's wrong with y'all? Why you? And I kept to why you gotta take something else and make it something completely not. It's not what it is, right? So I just don't think about it anymore. I can't. I can't because the more time I spend thinking about how to explain. What the difference is to somebody is the amount of time I'm spending not figuring out how to help my people move forward with the same movement. I don't have time to invest in that. Because, like you said, it's, it's, it's ignorance. <coughs> and sometimes I feel like people ask that are attention seekers. Like, you just want to start a conversation, but you really don't know much about Black Lives Matter. So that's the best way to get your foot in the door. I don't know. But it's really hard, you know. Even till this day, I, I don't hate officers. I dislike bad officers, period. I dislike people who abuse their power. I dislike the officers who have no care or any regards for human life when they get in their patrol car and put that badge on. That's what I dislike and it's disgusting. You know, I dislike the officers who don't hold their partners accountable when something like that goes on. They're just as bad as the people carrying out the actions, in my opinion. You know, so it's it's I say Black Lives Matter. I, I don't care to say all lives matter. And it's not that it doesn't. It's just as a human being, as a man, I carry myself all the time like all lives matter. I don't wish to cause harm to anyone for any reason. So I'm not going to ask somebody else if Black Lives Matter to you. Uh, you know, I'm not going to do that. So to put yourself in that space is kind of ridiculous. And it's a little redundant at times because it gets really annoying trying to explain that. But, uh, yeah, that's my No, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but go ahead. I want you to finish that point. No, I'm good. I, I, I think, for me, personally, it's in many cases when you're asked that question, you're not being asked that question by people of color. So I think when we deal with the issue of privilege, we must confront it. And yes, it's all right to be angry, and you can tell them as as many times as you want to. I have a simple. Uh, who I, there was a comedian who said uh, something to the effect of, uh, "I don't know of one white person that would ever want to be black." No matter what. No matter what. And it's very simple. There are certain people, there are certain institutions, because not all law enforcement officers are white, but they're in a gang. They're in a club. And they're privileged. So take ownership of your privilege and deal with the fact that in in some cases, you're probably marginalizing us because of what we look like, the way we speak, where we're from. Um, so it, it, it's very simple for me, it's just take ownership of, and if you're privileged to be a successful person of color, then own that. And you should not be ashamed of that. But know this, if you get pulled over, you're still going to be the N-word. And that's what it means. That's what it means. Whether you're elected, whether you're the president, it doesn't matter. In this country and in, and in many parts of the world, you're still the N-word. So I want to thank everyone for coming. Mavis, Victor, and Loretta for the terrific, informative presentation this evening. I think this has probably been our best 
uh, Ethnic Heritage Month meeting. Uh, I thank you for your participation. I thank Femi for putting it together. And I, I guess we, we all need to be reminded uh, that the struggle will have to continue. Um, you know, many of us thought it, was, it wasn't going to be as much of a need once we had a black president. <laughs> now we've got a president and it's, it's actually been a regression under the current administration. Um, the need to remember that Black Lives Matter is probably more important today than it's ever been uh, because our current president really believes that white lives matter and is really devalues, as, as Loretta said, like many other people, the lives of people of color. And we as individuals who are representing <coughs> people of color have to be strong and continue to fight in order to make sure that our clients get what they deserve. It's going to take a long time. I don't think I'm going to, I know I'm not going to see it. Uh, mm. Hopefully some of the younger people in this room will see it. Um, but, you know, I remember in 1968 when uh, Dr. Martin Luther King was, was assassinated. Uh, team, things had been very bad. Uh, they got better for a while. And unfortunately, I think they're, in many areas, they're deteriorating right now. Um, so we're going to have to regroup and recommit to fight uh, to make things better. And, and listen to the youth. Yes. And listen to the youth, like those kids in Florida. Yes.